What's up, everyone? Welcome to this name, Philly Sports History, for September 23rd, 2024. I'm your host, Jim Montgomery. Welcome to a Victory Monday edition of the podcast. Lots to talk about with this game, so let's get right into it. First of all, 15-12, to 12, the Eagles did come out on top. Shades of last year when they were winning ugly. But just like Andy Reid used to say, anytime you win in the National Football League, it's a good thing. So we will take it, get the hell out of New Orleans, and focus this week on Tampa Bay. Let's go back and look at our three keys to the game. Again, if you want to sponsor the three keys to the game, we're we're open for uh, negotiations. But first, I said you got to run the ball and control the clock. Well, they ran the ball 25 times for 172 yards and two touchdowns. Saquon, 17 of them for 147 yards including that 65-yard touchdown. And they did control the time of possession, 32 minutes and 15 seconds. They controlled it for a pretty good chunk of the first half, too, which is what helped keep that game close. It did open up the pass, which is what you look for with a solid running game. So I would say the Eagles were able to do that. Second key was defense. Do your job. And they certainly did their job and then some. It was a total team effort. Uh, They gave up 219 total yards and pretty much for the most part neutralized Alvin Kamara. Uh, They got a consistent pass rush that had been lacking. Jalen Carter played out of his mind. He was disruptive. Four tackles, two for losses, two pass deflections. Only hit the quarterback one time, but really, I felt, set the tone, and he was playing in beast mode, and that's what you need from him. And I really do think it opened it up for everyone else. They only got one sack, but much like turnovers, they come in bunches, so the fact that they were getting pressure, any pressure, I think, to me, is a bright spot and a positive moving forward. So I want to see them continue to build on that. We also had a Jordan Davis sighting who played a decent game as well. Secondary was good. Uh, Overall, great effort by the defense. I I mean, everyone played well. But I really think Jordan uh, Jalen Carter set the tone for that defense and played like just a grown man playing among boys. And that's, I think, what you need from him. That's what he's capable of. Uh, going back to when I was a kid, that's how Jerome Brown was, and he reminds me of a lot of him. So I, I want to see him. He plays with emotion. Uh, as long as he can keep those emotions in check, uh, that's what I want to see. So they certainly did that. And then the final key was getting turnovers. And again, these things come in bunches, uh, but they did get the one turnover that mattered and uh, at the end of the game to seal it. Uh, They did have the turnover differential not in their favor once again. Uh, They were minus one on turnovers. But again, the defense stepped up on that final uh, drive when they needed to and got the ball. And just like sacks, they do come in bunches. But I cannot be mad at all, not even a little bit, at the defense uh, after what they, they had been through and just, I'm sure it wasn't an easy week of practice, and it's it's obvious that Vic Fangio went back to the lab like Ben Simmons and was working on some things because they came out a completely different team. And really the team that I feel this defense should be like that on a consistent basis. So I want to see that build upon that going into the Tampa Bay game. Uh, so those were the three keys to the game, but there's some other things to talk about. Most notably, the quarterback and the head coach. Uh, I guess let's start with the quarterback. And I was taking notes watching the game at baseball yesterday and really uh, was ready to bury Jalen. Uh, I, I, I'm still not, maybe I'm not going to bury him today, but I think we need to have a legitimate conversation just about how good he is. Uh, I think it's very valid and fair to say that just maybe he's not that good uh, because he had the perfect opportunity. And look, they were moving the ball. I mean, I don't want to take too much away from what he did because they were moving the ball. Some bad coaching decisions, which we'll get into in a minute, killed some of those drives. But I I think the onus now goes to Kellen Moore to set Jalen up to be successful and play within his strengths. Uh, A few of those throws, just uh, again, just like last week, Devontae was there. Like, do a pump fake. 
make the the corner bite and and lob it up and just like we used to do with Deshaun Jackson, let him run underneath of it. It just uh, it, some of those throws um, and. <laughs> We went back and forth in one of my text chains on this one. The first interception before halftime, or I'm sorry, not before halftime, in the end zone. I, some pe- some of the people in the text chain were saying, no, that's not on Jalen. Other people were saying it's 100% on Jalen. And look, it was a terrible decision for him to throw that into double coverage. It was also a terrible decision for Kellen Moore to draw up that play because that play should have been, if that was A.J. Brown we're having a different conversation because A.J. Brown, that was for a, a bigger body, whether it was A.J. or Dallas Goddard. You don't throw to Devontae in double coverage like that. He's just not big enough to muscle that off. And whether that was the play call, whether that was on Jalen, Jalen can't throw the pass there. <clears throat> that is 100% on Jalen. And then the fumble, man, you have to take care of the ball. Uh, so I, I – Maybe it was fluky, but with the way he's been turning the ball over in his last few starts, you, you start to question. Maybe he's just not as great as we thought he was. And I, I think it's up to Kellen Moore and Nick Sirianni to sort of create a game plan that highlights his skills. And truthfully, if I don't see another RPO the rest of the season, I'll be happy. I, I think, first of all, I, I don't. I haven't seen it work. It looks like they're just confused. And uh, every time, like yesterday, it seemed as though every time they ran an RPO, it was it was stopped short or, or even for a loss. So I, I think defenses have caught up. It just doesn't work. Can we stop it? Like, I, uh, I, I don't see it. And what the hell are you doing what, running an option play? What is this, uh, Oklahoma versus Nebraska? Come on now. Uh, but Jalen this week, I, I want to see what he says in a press conference. And next week, I, I really do want to see how he responds. Because, um, yes, he played decent, but he's still making bad decisions. And I think the bad decisions are, are eventually going to catch up to him. And this is now, we have a pretty good sample size of him making poor decisions. Uh, I don't know whether it's reading the defense. Uh, he. Whatever it is, but there's something just off with his decision making. And now, speaking of decision making, Coach Sirianni, um, I don't think he had a good game, and I think that might be an understatement. Uh, I, I last week I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I, I think you can make the argument either way on those play calls, especially the one that Saquon dropped. But I, I think after last week, man, he's coming out and he's doubling down on the stupidity. And it's almost – he's borderline a liability for this team. And I'm okay with you being aggressive. Listen, I the, the first going for it on fourth down, I, okay, maybe I, what, in a game you kind of feel the flow of the game. You, you take the points and tie the game up. But you know what? You're aggressive. I'm okay with that. You go for it there. The one before the half just baffles me because I don't see, like, you got the ball, you have the ball coming back to you after halftime. And the play call, we'll get to the play call in a minute, but you kick the field goal, take the points, tie the game up, and then you have the ball coming back. And I think, especially with the the amount of time that was left, I think that's key there because they, when it was all said and done on the fourth down play, there's only 10 seconds left. So you're really going to take, what, one or two shots to the end zone. We already know Jalen had not been making good decisions with his passes, specifically in the red zone at that point. I just think the way the game was flowing, that was just a bonehead call. I know um, the guy on the Back to the Future Voice and Text line last week said moving the Sixers to uh, Market Street's a bonehead move. That was a bonehead move by Sirianni. And like I said, I mean, it's borderline. He's a liability out there. Uh, to his credit, he did take responsibility for it, but you got to clean that up. Uh, if they lose that game, much like the decisions from the week before, if they lose that game, we're having a much different conversation today. So I, I, I think I, I, somebody, I don't know who or what needs to, to talk to Sirianni about that, but and again, I don't know if it's analytics or talent, but the, nothing about that the first, second going for it on fourth down call made any sense. 
and then you kick a 60 yard or attempt a 60 yard field goal. like just some of the the questions about it but the play call itself why do a fake tush push do the whole thing like don't get too cute with it uh especially if you are giving up a chip shot field goal right before the half when you get the ball back after the half so i don't know uh, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on Sirianni, but at, at this point, I'm not in the fire him immediately, as some people were yesterday. But, I, I mean, he's borderline becoming a liability with some of these decisions. And he's the kind of guy that, is, to his credit, he's a stand-up guy and taking responsibility. But if it's analytics, then you need to, to double-check your analytics or, or have somebody in his ear saying, listen, man, game flow, feel – Use your eyes and trust your gut on this one because I, I just don't get the the benefits other than taking a couple shots to the end zone with a quarterback who has struggled getting the ball into the end zone inside the red zone. It just did uh, – it's perplexing to me. Um, but I did see someone point out on Twitter that really made me think uh, and kind of pulled me off the edge a little bit. Uh, and they brought up Andy Reid. We used to get on Andy Reid about his poor decisions with clock management and timeout usage all the time throughout, really, his entire 14-year career. But Andy won. So he sort of got a pass. And for some reason, I, I spent last week on Wednesday sticking up for Sirianni uh, and, and saying we need to be better. And, I, I mean, th those decisions were inexcusable. But... I mean, much like Andy Reid, Sirianni wins. Whether you like the guy or not, he's got a six. He wins two thirds of his games. So I think that's his only saving grace. My concern now is that some of these decisions, like I said, are becoming more of a liability. Uh, I feel as though they won yesterday uh, in spite of those decisions. So anxious to see how that goes. I, I'm, I have such a busy day this morning at work. But I'm dying to hear Sirianni's call into the morning show on WIP just to see what he has to say. Uh, and then Dallas Goddard, he is an elite tight end if you're using him. And they used him yesterday. Sure, he got lucky on the 60-yard play that three Saints <laughs> ran into each other. Uh, but kudos for Jalen. I, I mean, if I'm going to be fair, he, he saw it, got the ball to him at the right spot. And then Dallas just with a, an incredible run showing off his wheels. Uh, to set up that that game winning touchdown, so good win. Um, I, I do want to talk about the Saints' dirty play that hit on Devonte Smith. I cannot believe was not penalized. Like that was absolutely ridiculous. The dude was late. It was a dirty hit. And then the play where uh, the guy who I forget his name, the guy who's known for doing late blocks out of bounds, knocks Slay out of the game. It's ridiculous. And sure, they called the fifteen yarder on that one. But where was the penalty on Devante? They practically killed the poor guy. Uh, no word on his condition yet. Hopefully we'll get more today. But just dirty, dirty play from the New Orleans Saints yesterday. And um, Listen, uh, no need for that. All right, so then that leads us to – yeah, I'll talk. That leads us to who is the GOAT of the game. And honestly, I, I was torn on this. Got to go Saquon, 21 touches, 156 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, he is our GOAT of the game. Jalen Carter was very, very close. Uh, but I pose the question to you. Who is the GOAT of the game? 267-495-8531. That will get you into the Back to the Future voice and text line. I mean, you certainly can make the argument for Jalen Carter, who set the tone on that game. You can make a case for Dallas Goddard. Uh, so who do you got? Who is the GOAT of the game? Let me know your thoughts. Get your Sirianni thoughts. Anything else you want to talk about that game, 267-495-8531. That will get you into the Back to the Future voice and text line. All right, looking ahead. Tampa Bay lost to the Giants, so what seemed to be uh, everybody was anointing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Baker Mayfield uh, really becomes now a winnable game, and you can actually go into the bye three and one now. If you give me three and one in the bye, knowing what we need to clean up, I, I, I'll, I'll take that. 
so two and one right now. We'll we'll, we'll take it. Next week is going to be a huge game for Jalen Hurts. I think he needs to play a clean game, a smart game. Uh, but for now, let's revel in the victory. We'll we'll break down what the players and coaches had to say tomorrow. But they could have and probably should have blown this Saints team out. And and that's sort of what my takeaway is. That game didn't need to be as close as it was. Not especially the way that the defense is played. And we're now 1-2 and two on our official bets. Missed completely off the mark with yesterday's pick of over 49.5. And, uh, and when it wasn't even over 25.5. So, hey, you win some, you lose some. But good win for the Birds. Uh, lots to still talk about this week as we go, as we move on and look forward to Tampa Bay. But we'll take it. Be sure to let me know what your go or who your goat of the game is. Uh, I gave it to Saquon, but I was back and forth between him and Jalen Carter. Uh, you, like I said, you could certainly make the case for Goddard um, in a if you want to. If you're a Jalen Hurts uh, blind supporter, you could probably make the case for him as too. But let me know. 267-495-8531. Back to the future voice and text line. Who is your GOAT of the Eagles game yesterday? You know who was not the GOAT yesterday? The Phillies offense. Non-existent. Did not show up. Uh, two to one loss. Zach Wheeler was outstanding as usual. Made really one bad pitch. Uh, and that's what cost them. But I mean, your your starter gives up two runs. You've got to win. Um, and, and I'm not worried yet. Because I, I, there's still six games left, but the lead is only down to five for the division. Um, not worried yet, but I'm having, because we just talked about it last week, the, the fold of 64 is still on my mind. Uh, but they do have a three-game lead still on Milwaukee. The magic number to win that second seed and get the bye is three. They're now one game back of the Dodgers. Uh, that's going to definitely go down to the wire. They're back at it tonight against the Cubs. Aaron Nola is looking for them to... All they got to do is win a game, win the division, and I'll feel a hell of a lot better about all of this. But tonight, Aaron Nola, we need some of that playoff Nola tonight down at Citizens Bank Park. I'm sure the crowd is going to be rocking. All right, Union with a 4-0 win over D.C., very much strengthening their playoff position. Uh, Good win for them. Daniel Gazdog had two goals. Uh, and just a total team effort, and they have been red hot since the League's Cup tournament. So let's continue that to roll as we approach playoff season. Uh, they, Like I said, they certainly strengthened their, their playoff position. They got Atlanta next Saturday, who is currently chasing them in the playoff. Uh, but you got to win every single game. So shout out to the Union for a 4-0 win over D.C. United. All right, some housekeeping notes. Be sure to follow me on social media, Jimbo underscore Mont, Twitter and TikTok. Wait a minute. Follow me on Twitter and TikTok, Jimbo underscore Mont, at Philly Jimbo on Instagram. I'll get it right. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, Jimbo underscore Mont. Spread the word. Let people know if you're enjoying it. Our views have been going, like, this thing has grown a lot since football season started. So thank you for that. Continue to spread the word. Uh, I, I have some things on the horizon. I was supposed to do some um, prepping last night, and, but instead I was putting together a weight rack for my wife. That's how it goes. And that's part of why I keep saying it's coming, but other things. So just stay tuned. Spread the word, though. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Interact with the uh, Back to the Future voice and text line 267-495-8531. Get anything Philly sports related off your chest. And then go check out my boys at the Clashing Conferences. They're also doing some good things over there. Uh, whether you like football or baseball, they got you covered. Basketball season is right around the corner as well. Uh, and that's available wherever you get your podcast as well as on YouTube. And then go check out Philly Goat. Get your Red October gear ready. I guess we can allow the, the Sunday for, or for the Birds shirts uh, since the Eagles are 2-1. and one. It wasn't pretty, but the ugly wins count too. Uh, use the promo code Jim Montgomery for 10% off of your order. They got your election stuff covered. It's just a lot of fun and cool things over at Philly Goat. So go check them out and be sure to use the promo code Jim Montgomery for 10% off and to let Ryan and the crew over there know that you're listening. Flyers 6-2. It's preseason, I know, but 
Matt Vay Mishkoff with two assists. Morgan Frost had two goals. Bobby Brink had two goals. Uh, Jet Luchanko had two assists. It's going to be a fun, fun flyer season. They're back at it tonight in Montreal. But Mishkoff made his debut. Looked pretty good from the highlights I was seeing. I think tonight's game I read was is going to be streamed through the Flyers' website. So if you don't really want to watch one of the two Monday Night Football games, you can watch Matvey Mishkoff and the Philadelphia Flyers as they get ready to kick off their season. Okay, September 23rd is fight night in Philly sports history. We got... We're going to talk about two huge boxing matches that ha- occurred on this day in Philadelphia. First, we're going to go back to 1926, and Gene Tunney defeated Jack Dempsey for the heavyweight championship by unanimous decision. This fight, ironically, was supposed to be in Chicago, but it was moved to Philly because Al Capone, who was a Dempsey fan, they were afraid that he was going to to interfere and fix the boxing match. He was a big better. Uh, obviously, we know Al Capone's organized crime history and everything like that. Um, and I've read conflicting reports whether it was Dempsey who wanted the the fight moved or what. Uh, but in the end, it was Gene Tunney defeating Jack Dempsey for the heavyweight championship at Municipal Stadium, which became known as JFK Stadium uh, later on. In front of 120,000 people, over 120,000 people packed in to watch this fight. 39 million more listened to it on the radio. This is before the invention of the TV kids. Uh, but what a great fight. They would fight again in Chicago. Tunney won that fight as well. That was a controversial one. Uh, but the first fight took place in Philly after being moved from Chicago after concerns that Al Capone would have some sort of hand in the outcome of the match. And then 26 late years later in 1952, again, Municipal Stadium was the setting. Rocky Marciano fought Joe, Jersey Joe... Bleh. Rocky Marciano fought, fought Jersey Joe Walcott for the heavyweight championship. Go ahead and insert your own coming to America barbershop scene joke now. Joe Lewis was 175 years old. Anyway, Rocky Marciano and Jersey Joe Walcott. Walcott was the champ and the hometown hero. He was from Pensalkin, lived in Camden pretty much uh, most of his adult life, I believe. Uh, Marciano came in 42-0, and and Jersey Joe was 38, so he was sort of at the end of his uh, boxing career. Uh, <coughs> Jersey or Marciano won by KO in the 13th round, despite being knocked down in the first round, and he was also losing on the cards at the time. So had this been a 12-round, as we have today, heavyweight fight, Rocky Marciano would have lost to Jersey Joe Walcott, but instead he knocked him out in the 13th round. Uh, Marciano would win the rematch a year later by a first round knockout. Again, Jersey Joe was at the end of his career, but it was fight night in Philly on this day. First in 1926, Tunney Dempsey won. Gene Tunney winning by unanimous decision to win the heavyweight championship. And then 26 years later in 1952, Rocky Marciano beat hometown hero Jersey Joe Walcott by 13th round knockout despite losing on the cards at the time. And again, insert whatever coming to America joke that you want to now. He whooped Joe Lewis's ass. All right, I'm done. All right, finally today, our Philly sports villains. This one, ugh, Andrew Bynum and... Before we get into it, raise your hand if you fell for the Andrew Bynum hype. Yep, so did I. Sixers traded for him in 2012 as a four-team trade. I'm not going to go into the specifics because it was a very convoluted, complicated trade. End of the day, Sixers got Andrew Bynum, and it was he was introduced at the Constitution Center. It was like this big deal. I've bought into it. Everybody, everybody in Philly bought into it. So if you didn't raise your hand, you're lying because you were like, it's going to be different now. His knees are magically going to heal because we're in Philly. Uh, at least that's what I said. But Bynum was supposed to be the missing piece. They had a young team, Drew Holiday, Evan Turner, and Thad Young were like the three core guys. And then you add the big man. 
And at the time, the Sixers were sort of in NBA purgatory. They were like a 7, 8, 9, 10 seed in the playoffs. Um, they could play well against teams sometimes and then get blur- blown out. But they were missing sort of that over-the-top big star name. Uh, so Bynum got blood injections injection, injections in Germany. That's why it's a hard word. The English language is not my friend today. Uh, we're supposed to help his knees out, who he basically had zero fluid on his knees. Um, the, the the blood tra- uh, injections did not work. Uh, they never got better, so he got more injections. Then it started to get a little bit better. We, we kept hearing he's close to playing. He's 10 days away. He's seven days away. And it seemed like he was 10 days away for like four months. Uh, but that's another story. And even when it was starting to get better, this is what makes him the villain. He re-injured his knee as they were getting better. Bowling. There was video of him bowling. He injured his knee. Bowling. Never played a single minute in Philadelphia because he'd rather be bowling. Yep. That's why, Andrew Bynum, you are the villain. He did lead to the start of the process. Really, like everybody cleaned house after the, that season and the, the fiasco. Um, and, and again, I, I like the move. I liked it then. Uh, he was a goofy dude, but I mean, obviously, to to end your time in Philly by bowling. Uh, he did eventually play 26 games the following season between Cleveland and Indiana before he ended up hanging it up. This is another one of those villains who likely this is a, a villain due to the front office move. But this was a win-win or a lose-lose depending on your perspective. Either way, it led to the process which led us to Joel Embiid, which led us to where we are now. So if you are not a Joel Embiid fan, you are not a process fan, you are not a fan of the way the Sixers are currently constructed, you can thank Andrew Bynum for that. But Andrew Bynum is today's Philly sports villain, never got to play in Philly, and really damaged himself and injured himself bowling. And again, like I said, I, I just remember we were always, he was 10 days away, 10 days away, 10 days, two weeks, 10 days away for like six months. I, I, I think somewhere along the line, the doctors were lying to us, but who knows. On this day in 1926, Gene Tunney defeated Jack Dempsey for the heavyweight championship at Municipal Stadium, a.k.a. JFK Stadium. And then 26 years later, Rocky Marciano defeated hometown hero Jersey Joe Walcott again at Municipal Stadium to win the heavyweight championship. And we all know the rest of the story. Rocky Marciano never lost the fight, retired the undefeated heavyweight champion, almost lost this fight, though. I mean, he got knocked down and was getting beat pretty good by old Jersey Joe. So uh, probably one of the more tougher fights of Marciano's career. Uh, And again, for the third and final time, insert your coming to America joke. Aha! All right. Good win for the Birds. Let me know your thoughts on the GOAT of the game. Who deserves to be the MVP? Uh, we have a lot more to get into the rest of the week about this game, Sirianni's decision-making. All of that is fair game on the Back to the Future voice and text line, 267-495-8531. I'm hoping tomorrow that we can be celebrating a division championship. I just want to celebrate. And it's like the more they lose, the more anxious I get, and the more I'm like, they're going to blow it. They're not going to blow it, are they? This has been This Day in Philly Sports History for September 23rd, 2024. My name is Jim Montgomery. Go enjoy your victory Monday. And until next time, I'll see you when I see you.